All right, Patrick. Well, let's just start off. Um, give me your synopsis of, of what's been going on in the Great Lakes, specifically Lake Erie with, with lake water levels over the last pretty much, what, five to ten years? Yeah, so, you know, we started into uh, a rise in water levels about 2013 and 14, basin-wide. All the lakes started to respond to what was then turned out to be a several-year period of above-average annual precipitation in the basin. That's the primary driver. Once that starts happening, the water levels will go up because you're filling a bathtub and that water is going to go somewhere. There's no plug at the bottom, so they start to fill. Now, of course, last spring, you know, in a lot of areas of the basin, including here in Ohio, we had a lot of spring rain, and that just sort of pushed us right over the top. And so throughout much of last summer, most of the lakes set uh, all-time record highs. The, rec the, the record goes back, the length of data goes back to 1860 for some stations, sometimes it's 1916. Uh, 1985, 86 was the last period of record levels. And so, you know, start of last summer, and that has continued through now yeah we've had record precipitation for pretty much the last pretty much the last year or yeah. so um, how much does actual rainfall go into this how much is is snow uh, what what's kind of the combination how do those two work together well it's mostly rain I mean if you look basin wide year round that's that's the largest input and what people have to remember is it's not just Lake Erie and the rivers and streams like the Maumee that feed into it you know Lake Erie is part of the this large hydrographic system. It's, it's all one unit. So what happens hundreds and hundreds of miles away you know, in the drainage basin of Lake Superior, you know, that all is part of the system. So you have a drainage basin in the surface of the lake, but also a drainage basin that's millions of square miles that can collect this water. And once it starts to come in the system, you start to see it in the upper lakes in Superior, which then drains to Michigan and Huron, which drains down through the Detroit River into Erie, and then down on Ontario, and so on. So the large system has been responding to, to that input. And this high lake levels we've seen, especially in Michigan, has been causing some pretty dramatic effects with some of the houses along Lake Michigan, but we've seen damage here along the coast of Lake Erie within the last year as well. Talk to us about how those higher lake levels can increase erosion and cause damage to, to infrastructure. Right, so depending on where you're located, so for example in Lake Erie, in the western basin, more low-lying, so we tend to get more of the flooding impacts. But in the central basin of Lake Erie, both on the U.S. and Canadian side, uh, southern Lake Huron, southern Michigan, a lot of that shoreline are large glacial till clay bluffs with a narrow beach below them. So when the water levels come up, the beach gets covered and all of a sudden that wave action is directly impacting the base of those cliffs and basically starts to chew away a road of those which is, creates instability and you get large landfalls and slumps uh, that can occur um, especially considering the same rainfall is also soaking into the soils making that material softer causing um, other um, instability in those systems and then that's all it takes to start getting a tremendous amount of material moving in erosion at very rapid rate. So you can have a shoreline, even of a clay bluff, that maybe only erodes a few inches a year, but if you have prolonged high water levels where that wave action is right at the toe and eroding that, all of a sudden you can be losing feet per year. Talk to us about a timeline. This is something that isn't just a, a few weeks, a few months, or in some cases even a few years. These are long-term patterns, ebbs and flows, so to speak, of Great Lakes water levels, correct? Right, so if you go back to the recorded records 1860, you can see extended periods throughout that time frame where we do go through these cycles every 10, 12, 14 years, we hit a peak, then it will ebb back to an average, and then we'll go low again. Those occur, and so it's just part of the way that the system long-term is responding to those long-term variabilities in temperature, evaporation, and precipitation. And so we can see that, we know they're going to occur, we can't predict them. And unfortunately, you know, preceding the rise that we've seen since 2014, prior to that, we went through actually 14 years of average or below average, which was the longest period of kind of that kind of status mm -hmm. in the entire record. So you have a long period of time, everything looks fine, and then all of a sudden they start to rise and the cycle begins and you end up with a situation where the increased amount of rainfall year after year leads us to high and then record levels. So with high lake levels, what do you find interesting in your position or just even on a personal level that what are you looking forward to? What's going to kind of pique your interest moving forward maybe this year or the next few years with the lake water levels? 
Well, I mean, some of this is predictable because of the cycles. Um, as you can see the peak and you know the impacts is going to have. What the record also shows is these levels will come back down. So in 1985-86, the last records, you know, by 1988, so two and a half years later, we were back down close to the long-term average. We can't predict that forward. The, the best we can do in terms of wake like level forecast are about three months. But the cycles show, the record shows us that these cycles will go back down. We have to wait and see how long that may occur. Unfortunately, the situation we're in today in January of 2020 and where the levels are suggests at least for the next several months, the forecasts are that these levels are going to continue high. So many of the impacts that people were starting to experience last spring, last summer, whether it's erosion or flooding, is, is going to be problematic again this spring. You put on top of that, you know, when you look at historical water levels when they were at the peak, we think of it as a couple of years event, but actually specific storms during those years where not only do you have a high average or monthly level, you get a cease effect on Lake Erie, you get increased wave action, winds, you know, it's typically late fall, early spring where a storm event can make those damages even more significant. That's the big concern as we sit here now because as we move into our spring, we're going to get spring rainfall, we're going to get storm events. Um, you know, is that going to make the situation even more worse if we were to get a significant storm? Particularly on Lake Erie, we're vulnerable to, to a lot of those because of the orientation of the lake and uh, wind direction, etc. Okay. Anything else you want to add? It's a long-term problem in which there's no easy, quick fix. We don't regulate the system. The system is, there is regulation somewhat on the outfalls of both Superior and Ontario in a matter of a few inches. Uh, but Lake Erie is up two and a half, almost three feet. So it's a large dynamic system that we sort of have to hold on and just sort of ride it through like a roller coaster. And unfortunately, in 85, 86, there were a number of major federal studies, a lot of research on you know, what we could do better, all the various options, some of which was employed. But for the most part, you fall into a law of society. I mean, you go through that 13 or 14 year period and you don't think about it anymore, then all of a sudden it occurs again. So, you know, the, the frustration, but also the hope is you learn from something like this to think more long term. Mm -hmm. Cer certainly, infrastructure needs to be repaired. People need to move properties. I mean, there's that immediate crisis disaster type response. But then also to think about, okay, what is our long term plan here? You know, are we going to shore up that road or are we going to move it? You know, are we going to start looking at our infrastructure to think about in the long term? It's actually more economically efficient for us to think about long term solutions rather than every time we have a crisis, we, we put money in to fix it temporarily and deal with the immediate impact. These lake levels aren't going to go away. Uh, under the various climate change scenarios, you know, we're looking at high levels may still occur, low levels will looks like perhaps a frequency, so that period of 10 to 14 years, maybe it starts to get shorter, both for the, for the low and the high. Mm -hmm. This is not going to go away. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to better manage it as a society and figure out you know, how can we best invest and make good, wise decisions. These are natural evolving ecosystems. They change. They've changed ever since the Great Lakes were formed long before we <laughs> came along and settled here. Right. And so how do we live on a system that changes? You know, in this country, we've done a fair amount of adaptation to river flooding. You know, floodplain regulation, zoning, national flood insurance program. A lot of that came out of concerns in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. We still have problems there, but we've adapted to think about maybe it's not a good idea to be moving infrastructure and de new development into areas that are prone from a flood event that might only happen every 10 years, every 100 years. In terms of the shorelines and coastal erosion, the Great Lakes, and the other U.S. coasts, we're not quite far with that. Tour. Some of that's in place, but for the most part, we're not having the same kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. It happens less frequently, but when it does happen, people are impacted. Okay. You want to talk about ice. Yeah. Okay. You, have, you have some stuff you want to say about ice? Well, I mean, it's an interesting variable, right? So yeah. we don't have the ice cover that we typically would get. Right. And it sort of cuts a couple of different ways. One is... You know, by forming an ice foot along that shoreline, then when you start to get the warm up, you've at least got that shelf before it melts, so you've got some protection. So that wave mm -hmm. action isn't all of us still continuing right up over the beach, onto the dune, or on the cliff. So it provides a little bit of a, a buffer mm -hmm. while it's there. Well, yeah. we don't have it. So the concern is that as we progress quickly through the rest of winter, we start getting into spring, 
we start getting rain events, we start getting storm events, without that protection, mm -hmm. some of which would still be in place until it melted, we're a little more vulnerable to the erosion. Now the other issue, of course, is we have an open lake, right? So you have standing water that's not frozen over. Mm -hmm. So you have water that can evaporate. So the thought is, well, more evaporation should be good because it would lower water levels. Mm -hmm. Well, it's sort of a mixed bag because, of course, as, as it evaporates, it's also creating moisture in the atmosphere, which then can help feed into precipitation, and then you know you're sort or of feeding back this. in. Yeah, <laughs> clouds. Yeah. So some of the stuff I've been reading lately is that you know the impact of the uh, with the open lake in terms of evaporation this season, maybe three percent. So it does have an impact, but a few inches of evaporation when you're dealing with two and a half, three feet, isn't going to be enough to really protect us from. Again, ha still having these high water levels. Mm -hmm. But you're right, I mean, having some ice, uh, some ice would at least create a bit of a buffer for right. those few weeks. If we had a storm event, we're not gonna have that buffer if the ice isn't in place. I think that's what led to some of the destruction <coughs> last year out there in Marblehead and stuff, because we didn't have much ice last year either, and we had an early spring event and that did a lot of damage. That's all it takes. Now, yeah. The timing of that, not having the ice, things warm up quickly, you get a storm event. Yeah, that's that it. timing. Because you know, we typically get a lot of that kind of activity sure. late spring, or sorry, you know, spring in the, in the late winter.